Thank you, good afternoon. It's great to be here. I feel like um, those comedians or those um, singers who come out on tour and are like, wait, where am I? I? I flew from Fresno to Las Vegas, had a nice layover. Then the plane, next plane went to Des Moines and then St. Louis and then a very nice Uber driver drove me to Illinois. So I'm kind of like, wait, where are we? <laughs> what state am I in? I'm a California girl. I don't know this side of the world. Um, but it's very nice to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, and I just wanted to share today a little bit about this topic, being sent forth from the table as body of Christ. You're going to know a lot about me as we go along. But one of the things you need to know about me is that I love to sing. Since I was little, even if my mother would say, OK, enough, the, I would just keep singing. I would just keep going. And so that's been a big part of my ministry and a big part of prayer. So as we begin, I'd like to pray by teaching you a little bit of a song. I don't know if any of you have ever heard this song. Um, but it, I'm sorry the print is a little small, but it's very simple. You're going you're gonna to love it. So I'm going to sing it full one time, and then I'll just do half and half, and you'll hear how simple it is. It goes, we are one body, one body in Christ, and we do not stand alone. We are one body, one body in Christ, and he came that we might have life. Very simple. And I'll tell you this morning at prayer and at mass, I was so excited to hear that you are a singing group of deacons and wives, because that made me so excited. So let's try this again. We are one body. One body in Christ, and we do not stand alone. We are one body, one body in Christ, and He came that we might have life. And we begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord God, we thank you for gathering us this afternoon for this wonderful group of people who are here to know you, to love you, and to serve you and your people. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit upon us that we may hear the words that you wish us to hear and speak the words that you wish us to speak, recognizing that everything we do is in your name for this one body of Christ. As we pray, we are one body, one body in Christ, and we do not stand alone. We are one body, one body in Christ, and he came that we might have life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. This song I, is important to me in, in my life and is important to me in my ministry. And a big part of that came out when I looked on the USCCB website and was doing some research on other things and found this page uh, talking about the Eucharist. And I loved this quote. By eating the body and drinking the blood of Christ in the Eucharist, we become united to the person of Christ through his humanity. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. In being united to the humanity of Christ, we are at the same time united to his divinity. Our mortal and corruptible natures are transformed by being joined to the source of life. And as we are joined to the source of life, in that same way, we are joined to one another, right? We're joined to one another. We are one big family in this body of Christ. Now, I am a cradle Catholic, literally. I was born on October 8th, and I was baptized on October 9th. I had some kind of medical issue that my mother never felt comfortable disclosing to me. I don't know why. When I was young, she told me I had pneumonia. And then as I grew older, she told me that there was something that my tongue, the muscles in my tongue were not developed. My tongue kept going through to my throat and, and closing my breathing. And then and there was just, I, I don't know if my mother was just not, didn't really know because she wasn't with it at the time, which I totally understand. But for reasons unknown to me, I was in the hospital for two weeks after I was born and then later taken to the church and baptized. So I celebrate my birthday from October 8th through October 16th, which is the day that they took me to church. Uh, really, I'd like to go over the whole month of October, but it being Halloween, many people kind of frowned on that. So I just take the first couple of weeks to celebrate me. And, and I feel like that's very telling of my life, that from the second day of my life, I was committed to this church and to our Lord. Because ever since then, my life has been a series of Abraham moments. 
Like uh, Deacon Greg was saying this morning, I have no idea how I ended up in front of you good people in Illinois. When I was little, this was not my dream. My dream was either to be a teacher or Linda Ronstadt. <laughs> and so luckily I kind of got a combination of the two uh, and ending up, because I also do cancer now at my church, but this was not where I ended to, intended to go. My life was very guarded. I grew up in East LA, I'm very proud of my barrio, in East Los Angeles, California, um, in a very Hispanic, Mexican-American, Mexican community. 85% were Spanish speaking, and we, as English speaking, we were the minority, but it didn't feel like that because the majority of us grew up bilingual just by default because it was around us and everywhere we went. My first experience of the universal church came to me as an adult. Now, I had been hearing about the body of Christ since I was little, right? Cradle Catholic, grew up in the church, Catholic school from first grade through master's degree. Never, never wavered away. Graduated from college, went right back home to teach in my, my same Catholic school. My same principal hired me to teach in that school. So all my life, I've had one uh, secular job. For one summer, I was a, um, a receptionist at an investment banking company. And I hated it. <laughs> it was the same thing every morning. I walked in and sat down and made coffee and waited for people to come so I could greet them. And it was horrid. And I never did it again. All my life. But the first time I encountered the true meaning of universal church was when I went to World Youth Day in 1992. It was in, De uh, sorry, 93. It was in Denver, Colorado. And at the time, I was in my young 20s, and I was one of the two youth ministers, and our pastor came to me and said, hey, you know how the only car you've ever driven is your little tiny Honda Civic? Well, guess what? We're all going to drive to Denver. You're driving a minivan of teens, and we're going to camp all the way up. Now, one, I'd never driven anything bigger than my Civic, seriously. And two, to me, camping, my first experience of camping was when I went with a bunch of guys from our Bible study group, and they took a generator and a big screen, and at the time, a VHS player, and we watched Star Trek movies in the tent. That was my experience of camping. So now he's saying we're gonna camp all the way up from LA to Denver, and then thankfully, stay in hotels on the way home. But it was at the moment that I was standing in Cherry Creek National Park on the Saturday vigil. How many have ever been to Youth Day, World Youth Day? Anybody? Okay, just a few of you. So one of the biggest pieces of World Youth Day is on the Saturday, everybody makes a physical walking pilgrimage to the huge site where Mass is going to be held with the Holy Father on Sunday morning. But on Saturday night, you, you take your day to walk out there, you get a camping spot, everybody sleeps on the floor, they have music going, they have booths along the side you can go visit to buy things and, and you know, see different people that, that are coming and coming there from like the recording studio, uh, recording companies and, and all that kind of thing. It's a huge, huge event. So we were in Cherry Creek National Park that Saturday night and we had a group of Italian people on our left and a group of French people on our right, is that the, yeah, on our right, and I could hear all these languages bouncing around. And then Michael W. Smith, who at the time was the Christian music person of, of the, the year, his song, his music, and he's up there and the music is playing and people are cheering and dancing. And then we sang, we are one body, one body in Christ. And we do not stand alone. And I'm looking around going, holy mackerel. Our church is bigger than just Our Lady of Guadalupe in East LA. Our church is bigger than the Archdiocese of Los Angeles, which is huge enough, or it was in my. It's bigger than California. It's bigger than the US. And in my head, I'm thinking, why am I making such a big deal out of this? I know the marks of the church, one holy Catholic and apostolic. I know that the word Catholic means universal. We say these things in the creed. Why is this such a big deal to me? But it was, because it was my first real encounter with the entire, in my image at that moment, 
body of Christ in one place. This experience changed my view of church for the rest of my life because it was visible to me in front of it, in front of me. Because remember, I was the sheltered girl from East LA. Even when I went away to college, I went 45 minutes away from home. And my parents picked me up every weekend for the first year and a half. Uh, they'd come drive out, pick me up, and then drive me back home for the weekend, and then drive me back on Sunday. Every weekend for the first year and a half, because I had never been away from home for that long. And now here I am, surrounded by Catholics, young people from everywhere, proclaiming their faith in this universal God, their part in the universal church. I was so focused growing up on us, on who we were, my eyes were never opened to the rest of the world. So why is it so important? I'm talking about sending and I'm talking about body of Christ. Yes, that, that's true. But why is it so important that we pause to think about this? Because there are moments in our lives that we, do, we never forget. Unfortunately, there are sad ones. At one of the breaks, I, I was speaking with, uh, I think it was Deacon Max, about um, the pandemic and how we think we're back to normal, but we'll never be back to normal. There al will always be that trauma in us. Earlier when, when uh, Deacon Greg was talking about 9-11, um, you know, I was feeling so emotional because even though I was on the other side of the United States, my memory of that is that I was spending the day with m at my sister's house. My sister and brother-in-law were teachers. They came home from school. My niece was in preschool. They brought her with them. My brother-in-law is now retired National Guard Army and all I remember of that day was my sister asked me to take my niece outside to play so they could talk. And when we came back inside, my sister's eyes were bloodshot red and my brother-in-law was packing because he didn't know if he was gonna get called up to, to go out to New York. And, and we were scared. And I could only imagine that's a fraction of what people in New York and even and closer were feeling. We have those moments that change us, that are trauma. But we also have those moments of celebration. We have these moments in our faith journey where we can look back now and say, oh, that's why that happened, like those dominoes that we saw. That's why that happened. That's why God said to Father Bob, tell Rosie she needs to drive a van even though she's gonna be paranoid the whole time and a nervous wreck, that's okay. Tell her she needs to do it because it's gonna be life changing. Take a moment and think about that. The moments in your life that were life-changing, the moments in your life that lead to where you are. Those were important for us to see who we are in this body of Christ. As we are body of Christ, we need to celebrate together, yes? Because families don't just cry together. We do cry together because we need to, but families need to celebrate, right? How many of you have big celebrations for Christmas? Christmas. Thanksgiving, Easter, all the big days, birthdays. I was just texting with my sister all day and that's why my, fun, my phone is buzzing because I'm, I'm already starting to make plans for my birthday in October. We're gonna do a tea party. I just went to London for the first time in January and I'm all excited with teas, we went to two teas. So, But those kinds of things are fun, right? Or at least for me, I'm a girly girl, I love that stuff. It's fun to plan these celebrations and to live our lives in celebration. So as one body, we also need to, um, to celebrate. We also need to come together. So if we have the next slide show, please. Thanks, sorry. So this comes from a document, and I didn't write the whole document name out. Who knows, the, this is the one that came out for the Eucharistic Revival. The mystery of uh, the Eucharist, and there's another piece to it that I always forget. But number six says, yet we also know that he, Jesus, God, is present to us in a way that binds us together as one body, which we proclaim by our amen in responding to the invitation of the body of Christ. We don't say thank you, we don't say gimme, we say amen. The, uh, again, we call on the words of the beloved Polish Pope, we all know who that is. For this presence to be properly proclaimed and lived, it is not enough that the disciples of Christ pray individually and commemorate the death and resurrection of Christ inwardly, 
in the secrecy of their hearts. Those who have received the grace of baptism are not saved as individuals alone, but as members of the mystical body, having become part of the people of God. And we miss that sometimes. I'm sure most of you, well, all of you celebrate baptisms. Do you also do the baptism preparation? Right? So what we talk about in the baptism preparation is so vital to families. At my, at my last parish, when I was still in L.A., um, I was in charge of the, of the baptism, um, the, whole, the whole process. And the deacons, you know, had their part as well. We all worked together to do this, but I was kind of overseeing it as the pastoral associate. And so part of that was helping to prep the team that worked with the deacons and, and you know, that helped me do interviews and all of that. And so I had the, uh, the director of worship from L.A., our Chises of L.A., Sister Rosanna Belpedio. She was going to come out and do a workshop for us in Spanish for the teams that did baptism in our area, that did the baptism prep in our whole area. So it was about six or seven parishes. We came together much like this, and Sister Roseanne came out, and you know, she's doing this whole talk about baptism, and, and she started with, now what, is, what are the reasons that you know, people baptize? What does baptism mean to people? Let's just kind of start a conversation, whatever, and one hand, you know, several hands went up. She called on one of the person and said, to get rid of original sin. Okay, great, what else? could hear a pin drop. What else? And so finally a brave person said, well, what else is there? It's all about original sin. And she's like, okay, yes, yes, you're right, it is, but, and then she started talking about initiation and getting into the, and they're sitting there going, no, 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 what are you talking about? That's, we don't need to talk about that. Everybody already knows that. We don't, we don't need to talk about that in our classes. She's like, what, what are you talking about? They argued with her. For 15 minutes, I clocked it because I was in the back going, oh my God, please don't let that be my people. Please don't let that be my people. They're arguing with the director of worship for the archdiocese that she didn't know what she was talking about. Because all baptism was, what we had to talk to people was about, we have to clear their children of original sin so they can go to heaven if they die. And they would hear nothing else. That's not what we're here for, right? Please tell me that's not what we're here for right? That is a part. Yes, yes, and a very important part. But what about the part of being initiated into a body of believers? How many of our people understand that when they bring their children for baptism? How many of them understand what that whole body of Christ is? Heck, I barely found out about it at, what, 27? How do we help people understand that it's not just about me and God? It's always got to be the Trinity. Me, God, and my community. It's got to be. It can't be alone. I also work with um, Initiation Ministry, still known now as RCIA, soon to change. Um, but uh, RCIA, many years, that's, that's my main area of ministry, really. And so many groups are so into, like, this is my RCIA group. These are my people. And then what happens after Easter Vigil? They disappear. Why? Well, they don't know anybody in the church. They barely know when mass is because we let them go and then we take them out for the dismissal and then we say, this is my group. You don't need to know who they are. We're so possessive. We so want just the sacramental part of these things. We forget we're initiating people into a community. So these celebrations that we, that we celebrate as community, liturgy, yes? And the word liturgy is a Greek word that means work of, work of the people. I went to an amazing, this is another thing I knew all my life, yes, I, I studied ancient Greek for three years in college because I'm weird, um, but it was, it was fascinating. They, they got me in by saying, you know, if you study ancient Greek, you can translate the Bible. And the nerd in me went, I'm in. So I studied it for three years, I did a double major. And so I've always known that that's what that means. But last year, I went to the LA Religious Ed Congress, which is a huge congress on the West Coast, the biggest one, and uh, I've never missed in 30 years, seriously. And I heard a wonderful talk by Father Edward Foley. And he said, did you know that in the ancient Greek world, the word liturgy was actually tied to those who sponsored like the games or an athlete because they were sponsoring something for the people. 
they were paying for this to happen for the enjoyment of the community. Now let's look at the word liturgy in church. Is what we do in liturgy for the people? That one made me stop and think because I'm a cantor. I'm up on the altar almost every Sunday with a microphone. And it's very easy some Sundays to go, well, yeah, they chose this song, but I sound better when I sing this song, so let's do that one. <laughs> it is, no lie. I'm also in our diocesan choir, and um, we had the installation of our bishop, our new bishop, Bishop Brennan, came in a couple years ago. No, right before the pandemic. Anyway, so we're planning his installation, and I was working with the director as the director for the office. We don't have a worship director uh, currently, so I kind of take on that role sometimes. Um, and so I was working with the, the music director of the choir. We were putting things together. And I'm looking down the list, and I'm realizing, hey, they didn't give me any solos. I am one of the few bilingual cantors in this choir, and I don't have a solo. And all the, everything we're singing is bilingual because our bishop loves bilingual music. Everything is bilingual, and I had nothing. And I was like, Psh, why should I even show up? Good grief. I mean, in my head, I'm saying all this, whatever, you know, and I'm like, all right, get over yourself. <laughs> Day before the mass, woke up with laryngitis. No lie, no lie. I spent that mass sitting with my staff in the assembly with tears rolling down my eyes, not because I'm jealous and I want to be there, but, oh, dear Lord, you needed to teach me a lesson, and you did it well. Because guess what? Liturgy is not about me. And please don't be offended. Liturgy is not about you either. Liturgy is about the community gathered. Liturgy is about the work of the people for the people. And if it isn't benefiting the people, then is it truly liturgy? If it is what Rosie wants, not what the community needs. Is it truly liturgy? Is it serving? When we say that it is the work of the people and it's ours, then we give the idea that God's not involved, that we initiate and we do it for God. Is that true? Who initiates anything in our lives? God initiates, and we are here to serve. And together we serve for the people. Also in the mystery of the Eucharist, I just love this document. I've been reading it piece by piece. If you haven't read it yet, check it out. The obligation to attend Mass each Sunday, the Lord's Day, on which we commemorate the resurrection of Jesus and on other holy days of obligation, is therefore a vital expression of our unity as members of the body of Christ. We are members of the body of Christ. Who's in charge? God, not us. We are members. Look at the person next to you and remind them, you are a member of the body of Christ. Go on, look at them, tell them. You are a member. We are, we are all members. And it's important for us to remind ourselves every which way we go. We need to build ourselves up as a Eucharistic people, but it has to be for everybody. And we can't, and I love, I love this moment, we can't look to the body of Christ in the hands of the priest of the consecration and ignore the person next to us. They have to be included peripherally in that view when we look to the body of Christ. If not, we're doing it wrong. When the Eucharistic revival, when all that started up and we started talking about it, I was really excited. And, and I was excited and then a little disappointed because it was coming off the synod, which 
which we'll get to in a little bit, but I was very disappointed in the Synod in my diocese at least. But then they started talking Eucharistic revival and I got excited and our chancellor called me and said, do you want to be on the team to you know, talk about the Eucharistic revival for the diocese? And I said, yes, you know I'm there, I love events, I love workshops, I love retreats. And she said, great. So we went on, the, on this uh, meeting Zoom for the first initiatory meeting and it was me, the chancellor, who's a woman, a lay woman that I've known for many years, and three of our priests. And I said, okay, this is good, but could we not have expanded this a little bit? You know, a couple of deacons, a couple of more lay people have a bit, but that's okay, they were good priests, and I was like, okay, we'll do this. So we start, and all anybody's talking about is, well, we should have Eucharistic adoration here, and we could have Eucharistic adoration there, and maybe we should do it in different vicariates, each one has a different day of adoration, and so that there's always adoration, and I'm like, excuse me, are we gonna have a mass at any point in these celebrations? <laughs> because, hello, source and summit, liturgical celebration, body of Christ, you know? And, and this was the same of a lot of our people, Eucharistic adoration, I'm um, Eucharistic revival, and they all wanted to know only where's adoration. Now, I'm not against adoration at all. I love Eucharistic adoration, adoration benediction, all the whole holy hours, everything. I, I love every part of that. But then we forget to go to the root, to the moment to the mass when we're gathered as community to be one in that liturgy. We can't just look at the body of Christ and ignore the people next to us. The Eucharist has to be an encounter with a relational God. Deacon talked about um, you know, only one third of the people in your pews, not people in the world, in your pews believe in the true presence. Sherry Waddell wrote a book year, a few years ago, well, it must be like 10 years ago now, uh, The Forming Intentional Disciples. 66% of the people in your pews believe in a personal relationship with God. And we all kind of go, yeah, we've heard that. That's scary. So what are people learning? What are people coming to church for? if they don't believe in true presence, if they don't believe their God is a personal God, then what are we doing here? Do you wanna take some slides off, please? Thanks. So I always look to the road to Emmaus, right? We all know the story. I'm not gonna tell the story, don't worry. Um, if, we were, if we were at a bilingual crowd, I know a Spanish song we could sing, but oh well. We can't do that, sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, anybody here speak Spanish? Yeah. Hey, you know the, the, the Maus, the song? Yeah, yeah. When I do this talk in Spanish, we sing through the whole song because we all know that one. Um, but it's a song that basically tells the whole story of, of the road to Emmaus. And I use it a lot because, as I said, I do a lot of initiation ministry, and so I talk a lot about the catechumenate model. If you've ever read any catechetical document, Everyone has for years been saying the catechumenate model is the way to go. And for years we've ignored it until finally the director of catechesis came out and said, you know, Pope Francis says we all got to look at the catechumenate model. Now suddenly everybody wants to know about it. And if you don't know what the catechumenate model is, basically it's RCIA. It's taking the, the pieces of RCIA and working them into everything that we do. Because the, the process of RCIA is supposed to be relational. It's supposed to be about meeting Christ on that road. And the road to Emmaus tells us about that story, right? Because Jesus meets these guys walking, and what are they doing? They're talking. And does Jesus say, oh, guys, you're getting it wrong. Let me tell you how it's supposed to be. What does he do first? He listens. He listens. And we always forget that part. He listens. And then he talks, and then they go invite him to dinner, and they notice him when? In the breaking of the bread. They don't notice him in the bread, in the Eucharist. They notice him in the verb, in the breaking of the bread. That's important. That's an important piece for us to remember. It was in the action, in the action. You can't have body of Christ without it being broken and shared. So when we celebrate that in the liturgy and then we're sent forth, yeah, she's finally getting to the point. We're sent forth. What does that mean? Well, you're deacons, you tell me. You get the last word, which 
I always found the counter was kind of unfair because, you know, I'm up there too and I sing, but no, you guys get the last word. That's okay. But I love that it was sung at this mass we had. Kudos. Who was the deacon that was deaconing mass today for you? There you are. Kudos. Thank you. I can't even get my priest to do that and my deacons forget it. They don't want to sing. So thank you for doing that. I loved it. What is the last words as we're going forth from mass? What do you say? In English, because my Latin's not bad. My Greek's excellent, but my, my Latin's really bad. Say it again, somebody. Go forth and announce the gospel of the Lord. Go forth and live the gospel. Something along those lines, right? Go and do something. Not just get out. Go and do something. Yeah. Let me tell you, I know priests, never mind. Um, <laughs> who just kind of said, get out of here. Go and do something with it. When you get a gift, no, let's, let's put that better. Ladies, when you got engaged, did you hide that ring in the back of your closet so no one could see it? What did you do when you got that engagement ring? Exactly. Look, look. I don't have one. I'm, this is the, the right hand. I don't have one. Sorry. I'll show off this ring. Look, look, look at my ring. And what did the other ladies do? Did they say, ah, oh, yeah, 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 that's nice. I got one too. What's the big deal? What did the other ladies around you do? Yeah, they were excited for you. That's how you should be feeling when you leave the Eucharist, when you are sent forth. That's how we all should feel. We go out dancing. I always want the last song that we do, our, our send, and I call it the sending forth song because that's what we're doing. I say when now we're being sent forth, let us sing, and I don't sing something boring and slow. God of day and God of darkness. No. I sing something that people will sing and that will make them hum it the rest of their day and rue the day I was born. That's what I like to do. Now, the one we sang today was perfect, right? Because what, did, what, did, what were some of the words that the song we sang today as we were going forth say? That we're sent forth to what? Yeah, to do all sorts of things. I wanted to bring a song book with me, but I didn't want them to think I was stealing. Because I'd never sung that song before. I'd seen it, but I've never sung it before. And so I was like, I, I love this. This is exactly, let's go forth to feed the poor. Let's go forth to heal the broken. Let's go forth to find people who need God in their lives. That's what we're sent forth to do. That's what the Eucharist is supposed to make us excited to do. So that we leave the mass going, where am I going? Who am I going to go talk to? How can I make this alive in my life and in somebody else's life? It's a verb, people. It's a verb. We do it. We sent, we're being sent forth to be Christ to other people. That's what we're doing. And in order to do that, we have to ask, do our liturgical experiences feed people so that they feel nourished when they walk out that door to be Christ to others? Do they feed people? And, and please don't, I'm not going to look to the only the homilist. I'm not going to look to only the music because there's got to be more. There's got to be more that we do as church, as the body of Christ. How can we make our experiences in liturgy be personal experiences and encounters for the people that are there? I'm going to give you some structured examples in a few minutes, but I'm going to say this. As church, what do we teach about Eucharist right now? Now, I don't know how it is in your diocese, but let me tell you how it is in my diocese. In my diocese, every July and August, people come to the parish office and want to register for First Communion. Did you see that happen here? They want to register for First Communion. They don't want to register for religious ed. They don't want to register for permit. They don't know it that way. They know it as, I need to register my child for First Communion. So we say, yes, I'll register your child for First Communion. And the child comes to classes for a couple of years, and they're prepared for First Communion. And then on that sunny day in May, their last day of class, they receive their First Communion. And then we get mad when they don't come back and say, what horrible parents these are that don't bring their children back. Well, we set us up, ourselves up for failure here. Because what did they register for? What did they prepare for? 
What did they get? So we're done. We set ourselves up for failure with the language. We don't say, come and have your child's faith be taught and let them grow in their faith. We don't say, come and bring your children so that they can meet other children and, and get to know God together. We say, come and prepare them for first communion. Then they receive first communion. Okay, you're done. That's what they hear. That's what they hear. And we're essentially saying it with our actions. This is why we look to something different like the catechumen and model. Because in our present day model, Eucharist is an event. And boy, is First Communion an event. Or is that just me? Yeah. I get the ridiculous calls in my office because we're the diocesan office. You know, I get the calls that are like, I have this child that doesn't want to wear a white dress. What do I do? Um, let them wear whatever they want. I don't know. But she wants to wear a dress that's not white and it has butterflies on it. <laughs> it sounds pretty to me, actually, to ask her where she got it. I, I don't know. I don't know. And then I had another one, and, and forgive me if I offend anyone, but I have a girl who doesn't want to wear a dress at all. Okay? Yeah, I know. That's what she wanted me to do. <gasps> the end of the world. I have a child who doesn't want to wear She wants to wear pants to First Communion. What do I do? Well, if they're nice pants and not jeans, what's the big deal? But then where do I sit her, with the boys or with the girls? Because if she wants to wear pants, it might be because she thinks she wants to be a boy, and I don't want to encourage that. She may be a girl who just doesn't want to wear pants. She's eight. Why is that so important in First Communion? Because we've made it an event. We've made it a moment in their lives where a million pictures have to be taken, they have to be dressed to a T, and the mass has to be at a good time for us to get out in time to make our reservation for lunch. That's what we've made it. Instead of what it should be, a moment of celebration with community that continues every Sunday because we're excited to be with our community. So when we're sent forth from that table, we should know our purpose and our mission. We should know that it wasn't just a one-time thing that, oh, Mass was kind of good today, but that it's always good and it's always enthusiastic because we know that our purpose is to evangelize, to go make disciples, and to be a Eucharistic people because we are one body, one body in Christ, and we do not stand alone. We are one body, one body in Christ, and he came that we might have life. And so because we are, I am in the coveted after lunch space of a, of a nice long day after a fantabulous lunch, if you feel the need, get up and stretch. We're going to do a one-minute stretch. If you get the need, step, stand up and stretch, move your fingers, move your toes, talk to the person next to you, make sure they're awake. If they're not, give them a pinch. I mean, give them a nudge. And I'd like you to think of one word to describe, not this morning, but the last Sunday liturgy that you went to and share it with one of your neighbors. One word to describe the last Sunday liturgy you went to and share it with your neighbor. Go. Wow, those are long words. All right, let's come back together. I find that's a great way to get people back together because they'll go, sit down or she'll stop singing. <laughs> so, yeah, because another minute and I'll be going into The Little Mermaid, so hang on. Um, so how do we do this then? How do we make our communities a Eucharistic community? How do we help people understand what it means to be part of the body of Christ? That it's not just for a moment, but for a life. That it's about much more than just me. Well, I'm going to give you three ways. One is hospitality. 
and you're all going, oh, yeah, we got that one, check. When you next go to Sunday Mass, I want you, not in, a, in an evil way, watch the hospitality at your parish. And what does that look like? What does it look like when people, especially people who've never been there, walk into your church? For most of my life, I have worked at parishes. And so, I was always at parishes. Sunday, many times, was my longest work day. I was there every day, all the time. That was when I was in, living in LA. 10 years ago, I moved to the Diocese of Fresno to take this job as the director of formation. And my first weekend, in and I knew nobody there. I knew one person peripherally. I went to all girls high school. When we went in, we got a big sister. So my older sister's big sister lived in Fresno. But by the time I entered high school, she had graduated and gone. So I didn't know her personally, but I knew her kind of peripherally. She's the only person I knew. And luckily, she was still Catholic. And so she was very generous and, and kind and, and showed me around and such. She was the only person I knew. So the first Sunday that I was in Fresno by myself, I went to the local church, because I previous Sunday my sister was there helping me unpack and da-da-da. So this is first, my first Sunday alone. I went to the local church, the one five minutes from my house, and I thought, this is my parish. Now I get to be a parishioner, and not the one running around making sure we have enough lectors and the, the ushers are where they need to be, and oh, the Eucharistic ministers are going up on time. That's not me anymore. I can just go be assembly. And I was so excited. And I walked in, and not one person said hello to me, including the ushers, who all looked very dapper in their matching blazers, standing in the front talking to each other. Not one person. I went to mass there for about five months. And even the pastor didn't say hi to me. After I introduced myself, he didn't like me for some reason. I don't know. He heard something about me from L.A., I guess, and he just didn't like me right away. Uh, but I'd, I've never felt more alone in my life. And I've been to Mass alone many times in my life. I'm not married. I don't have children. I, I'm fine being alone. I go to restaurants alone. I travel alone. But I've never felt more alone than those Sundays when I went to Mass there. And so I started parish hopping because, you know, I'm, I got to find a parish home. I was dying. I need to find a parish home. And so along the ways, I would meet people. And I met this wonderful young man who was doing music for an event somebody else in my office was doing. And I went just to support her. And he was doing the music, and he was singing all the bilingual music that I loved. And so afterwards, I went up, and I said, oh, my God, thank you. You did all. I'm crying back there. This is stuff I used to sing in L.A., you know, all the bilingual stuff. And he said, oh, you should come to our church, and, you know, we'd love to have you. And I, yeah, well, I'm not ready to commit to a ministry, but maybe I'll, I'll go visit you. Just so happened a couple of months later, their RCIA director called me and said, you know, my RCIA team needs a revamp. They, like, don't know what they're doing. We need formation. Can you come and meet our team? And so I did with good intentions, and then like most Catholics do that have sucker written on their forehead, I end up getting talked into being part of their team. So I said, all right, you know, I, I love, um, who is it? Is it Job or Jeremiah? You duped me, Lord, and I've been duped, and I let myself be duped. Yeah, that's, I'm going to make t-shirts, and it's going to be the big seller of my retirement. Um, so I, I said, well, this is, I'm going to be in the RCA team. I need to learn the community, so I need to go to Mass there. So I walk into my first 930 Mass in St. Paul Catholic Newman Center. I walk in, and as I'm at the front, I'm getting to the first periphery, it looks like this, where there's two doors. I get to the first door, and there's a very nice gentleman, very tall, opens the door and says, good morning. And I said, good morning, and I just thought, oh, he's a nice man who opened the door for me. And then I walked in, I turned around, and no, that's his job, to stand at that first door and say good morning. I get to the second door that leads right into the chapel, and there's another lovely lady that says, good morning, welcome, and opens that door. And I said, wow, that's more than anybody at the other church ever spoke to me in five months. So I'm really like, okay, this is great. So I start walking in, and I see this woman running from the front of the chapel all the way back to me, and I realize that it is, may she rest in peace, our deacon's wife. And I had met her at another event. And she comes running to me with her arm. I felt like the prodigal son. Her arms raised to me, Rosie! And she gives me this big hug. And she puts her arm around me, and proceeds to walk into the church where because she was an amazing woman that everybody knew and loved, every third person we saw stopped her to say hello. And each time they did, she said, oh, it's good to see you. Have you met Rosie? She's our new director of formation. And then two more people, have you met Rosie? She's an amazing singer. Hopefully she'll join our choir. And then the next one, this is Rosie. 
she's helping the RCIA team. And I'm looking at her like, how do you know this much about me? We've only met a couple of times. I felt like I was enveloped in a mother's arms. And to this day, that is my home parish. And I largely attribute that to her. Thank you, Betsy, for helping me find a parish home. That was hospitality. Was she an usher? Was she a minister of that church in any formal way? Yes, as a deacon's wife. And she felt that her job as a deacon's wife was to make everyone feel comfortable and everybody loved Betsy. That was her gift. That was her way of ministering. And she made me feel at home. What does our church feel like when people enter? Do they feel important? Do they feel loved? Sometimes all it takes is a smile and a good morning. That's all. You don't have to be Betsy and run around and introduce everybody and be matchmaker. You don't have to do that. All you have to do is help everybody in your community understand. This is our community, and when people come in, we smile and we say hello. And that's what this community does. When I was in uh, my first parish doing my master's uh, in pastoral studies, I had to do a practicum. And the one that I chose to do with my pastor, same one that made me drive to Denver, was to do these evangelization retreats, where we would have these retreats, and then we would gather people and do small faith communities in the homes. Okay? And so people were excited and wanted to do it. We had the first meeting with all the leadership of the parish explaining what we're going to do. And they got excited and said, yes, let's do this. We're going to go door to door, and we're going to invite people to church. And he said, wait, stop. What are you inviting them to? Well, to come to Mass because we have to save their souls. Okay, but what are you inviting them to? Who are we as a parish? And they all looked at each other, and he said, we got to do that first. We had to figure out who we are as a parish before we begin to invite the other people in. Who are we as body of Christ? And so we did that for about a year and a half. Parishioners went to retreats. We did studies. We did study days, and we'd have hundreds of people, and we'd come together, and we'd talk about who is Christ to us. And then the pastor said, now we're ready. We know who we are. We know who Christ is in our hearts. We know the importance of, of the Eucharist. We know the importance of evangelization and sharing God's word. Now we can go out and do it. And we did, and it was amazing. We, I had an amazing five years there doing that program. Who are we as body of Christ in our parishes? And how can we make people a part of that with us without saying you have to be a part of it with us? Well, that's going to lead me to number two, and that's accompaniment. True accompaniment. We kind of think accompaniment just means like, oh yeah, I'm her sponsor, I call her once a month to see how she's doing. But true accompaniment is like Emmaus, walking with people and listening to them. I cannot tell you how sad I was at the synod in my diocese. How many participated in the synod? Ooh, may, maybe here too. Because <laughs> that was about us. We had 89 parishes, but I think we had 32 participate in the synod at the parish level. And I was so sad. Early on, while we were getting everything ready, I was part of that committee too, so I was getting all the, you know, the surveys ready and all the, the resources for the parishes. We have, my office uh, puts on the Lay Formation Institute, which is the leadership, three-year leadership program that is also the prerequisite for the diaconate in our diocese. It's part of the diaconate, the aspirancy process. And so um, I had this group and they would meet every week. We met every Tuesday. And this one particular Tuesday, the, the speaker had a family emergency and had to cancel. And so my assistant tells me, hey, we don't have any for tonight. What do you want to do? Do we cancel? And I said, no, I'm going to take advantage. And I'm going to do a little mi mini synod session with them. Because then when they go back to their parishes, they'll get excited and they'll do it there, right? Okay, best laid plans. What was that? You t uh, want to make God laugh? Tell them your plans. God laughed at me that day. So I make this whole thing, I put this thing together, and I bring this to our leaders, the people we're training to be leaders. And one of the questions that I had for them was along the lines of, of actually of hospitality. How do we make people, how do we bring people to the church? How do we make people present, feel present in our, in our community, especially post-pandemic, when people are still at home uh, and, you know, hey, it's easier to lie on the couch and watch the mask than drive down the street and go to mass. How do we help encourage them to be part of the body of Christ again? They went off in little groups. They came to this all online, by the way, on Zoom. They went off in little groups. They come back. I have them reporting. And they're saying things like, we let them know the hours the church is open. 
okay. And then somebody else said something along the lines of, well, they know when mass is. If they don't come, they must not really want to be Catholic. And I'm on Zoom. I'm chatting privately with my assistant who's taking notes, going, am I hearing what I'm hearing or did I fall asleep during the break and this was a dream? And she's like, oh, my God. And we just both kept saying, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. There was not one mention of outreach. There was not one mention of listening. There was not one mention of welcoming. Not one. It was like, what is that movie, Field of Dreams? We built it. They need to come. I know I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> right? It's built so the people should be here. And if they're not here, it's because they don't want to be here. Guess what? People were suffering. People were losing family. People were not able to have funerals. My mother passed during the pandemic. She passed in 2021, January 2021. Large Mexican family. We were blessed because our, our funeral, our uh, Catholic cemetery had made an outdoor chapel. So we were able to have 40 people at the funeral. That was a blessing, because I have friends who were only able to have 10 at the funerals of their parents. But large Hispanic family here. We, had to, we could only have 40. That was not the way I wanted to send my mother off. My mother brought me my love of music. I was barely able to sing at her funeral, because it was just so hard. People were suffering. And I recognize that I'm not the only one. But I know that pain. And many of you do too. And our response was, well, the doors are open. They can come if they want. That was not where we needed to go. We needed accompaniment. We needed the people that would journey to us, whether it be via phone or whatever, to be by our side. My father died before the pandemic in 2018. And we held, I was in Fresno. My older sister lives in, in the Antelope Valley, which was another hour and a half away from East LA, where we were from, we're all from. Most of my cousins were far in you know, other areas. My little sister lived another two hours down south. For my father's funeral, it was packed. And not only that, but seminarians from my diocese drove down to my father's funeral to accompany me. That was accompaniment. Now, for my mom, I know people couldn't. But just that, that moment of getting up to lead that vigil and look out and see family and friends from East LA, from Whittier, from North, from Rancho Cucamonga, from North Hills, where my other parish was, for Fresno, there's Fresno people in the back. Fresno, by the, if you don't know, Fresno and LA are about three hours, three and a half hours driving apart. And people drove down to be there with my family. That's accompaniment. How do we walk with people? How do we walk with people to show them we are Christ? Deacon's story about the person who walked for an hour to make sure that the young man could get to synagogue, would get there and not feel alone. Yesterday, last night, my Uber driver went through RCIA to become Catholic. And you know why? We had a long drive, so he told me a story, and he was great. <laughs> it was great. I loved hearing it. I'm like, oh, my God, I loved hearing the fruits of this. You know why? Because he was living in New Orleans, Hurricane Katrina, the local priest took in him, him and his wife, even though they were Baptist. He said it that way. We weren't even Catholic. And the priest housed us. We lived with him until we could find a place to live. And he made me see Jesus in action. Ouch. That's what we all need to be doing. Well, not that extreme. But that's what we all need to be doing whether it's giving a bagel to someone or opening our doors to our house or simply inviting them to church or saying hi to them when they walk into a strange place. That's what we need to do. We need to walk with them. One more story, and then I'll get to the last one. During my time in East LA when I was doing the small faith communities, um, one of the negative things about living in a, in a community that's highly uh, Hispanic, and by the time I was in adulthood, it was from Guatemala, El Salvador, um, Mexico, everywhere, everywhere in Latin America, we had people. And it was great. I loved it as a, as a 
as an adult than finally a bilingual person. I loved it, learned so much about culture. But a lot of times the English community felt very isolated. And so we had, we ended up with only one uh, faith community, small faith community that met weekly in English and I was a part of it. I didn't lead it, it wasn't because of me, but that became the community that I was a part of. And we were together for several years and we had an amazing time and even after I moved to Fresno every now and then, I would drive back and anyway, so I kept in touch with all of them. There was this one day, so the setup of my parish was the church was, you know, on the street here on a corner, and then you went up a really steep hill, we call it Hazard Hill, that was the name of the street, believe it or not. Hazard Hill was horrible to climb, to walk up, it was really steep, and up at the top of there we had another little community that was part of our parish, but in the early days of the parish they built a chapel up there, because this is before everybody had cars, and so people were saying, we can't walk all the way down <laughs> to the church, it was a really hard walk, so that we had another chapel, so at this point, we didn't have weekly, we had only weekly mass there, one, one mass a Sunday. So they made it into the evangelization center and father gave me it, do it, make it, a, make it a center of learning. So that was where my office was in the basement of that chapel. We made it really nice, had a library and a, a whole little living room and kitchenette and a whole setup where I could do small meetings and large meetings and it was great. So one day I'm at the lower level at the church all day doing meetings and whatever. And at four o'clock I'm driving up the hill to go to my office because I have a meeting at seven, so if I get to my office by 4.05, I have a good hour to work, then run to Jack of the Box and grab something to eat, and be back here to set up for the, for the next meeting. So I have it all timed out in my head, right? Okay, this is what I'm gonna do. I get to my office, get out of my car, open the door to my office, and I encounter three inches of water across the whole bottom. The pipe that I had been telling them for weeks Something was wrong, and they told me I was crazy, that I wasn't hearing water rushing in the walls. Finally burst through, and my office was flooded. I turn around and walk out of my office. I grab, thank God it was cell phone time, barely. I had my cell phone. I grab my cell phone. I call the office down at the church, and they say, oh, the maintenance person left already. And I said, oh, that's good. He lives down the street from my office. And they said, no, he went to go pick up one of his kids from LAX. He won't be back until nine o'clock or so. I have no idea what to do. I had a meeting. I had things I had to get done. I sat on the floor and I cried. And I'm not kidding, I'm a big crybaby. Sat on the floor and cried. And then I calmed down and I called my friend who's living, just lived down the street um, near the chapel and just to commiserate. And she was part of my small faith community. And I said, oh my God, I don't know what to do. I have to figure out what I'm gonna do here. Uh, maybe I'll go back down to the church. I don't, and she said, just wait there. And hung up and I thought, well, she's gonna come, but what are we gonna do? I'm a scaredy cat. I'm not gonna set foot in that office. There's computers, there's electrical outlets. I'm gonna electrify myself and die right here and no one's gonna know where I am. I'm not doing this. Okay, I'm a little dramatic, I know. So I'm sitting there waiting and about 15 minutes later, one of my friends drives up and he gets out of his truck and he says, let me go check it out and see what's going on. Oh. Okay, what are you doing here? Olivia calls me. Okay, so he goes off and starts checking on. And then somebody else drives up and he gets out and he's got a shop back in his arms. And he says, okay, I'm here, where's the water? Oh, what are you doing here? Olivia called me. Okay, I get a phone call on my cell phone. Hey Rosie, this is Joanne, another member of my community. I called everybody that's supposed to come to the meeting tonight and told them it's canceled. Don't worry, we'll do it next week. I already set the date, we'll put it together. Don't worry about that, that's done. What? Olivia called me. Oh, okay. Within an hour and a half, my entire faith community was there. The last one to arrive brought cheeseburgers, fries, and drinks. And we all stayed until my office was clean and ready to use for the next morning. That's accompaniment, my friends. And five years later, when I celebrated my birthday and threw a big party from, okay, I'll say it. I celebrated my 50th birthday and I threw a big party for myself at a hotel in Fresno. My entire faith community drove up from LA to celebrate with me. That's accompaniment. How do we do accompaniment in our parishes? How do we make sure those RCIA people know somebody besides the people in their group so they can come to Mass the next Sunday and feel comfortable? How do we make sure that the families 
whose children are being prepared for First Communion learn and become aware that First Communion isn't an event. It's a life change. How? Because if we're just doing it like this, it's obviously not working. What can we do different? Last point, promise. The last thing is encounter. An encounter for action. That people encounter the living Christ in such a way that it moves them to do something. And, and we heard about that. Where is your Calcutta? Where is your Calcutta? Personally. Where are the people that you see that need ministering to? This is another thing that made me mad about the Synod. People glazed over things when they talked about who are, the, who are on the peripheries. Glazed over them. I'm sorry. I was so disappointed. No one mentioned the elderly that are at home, bedridden. At the time, I, uh, well, not at that time, but it was a big point for me because my mom was like that for the last years of her life. No one mentioned the people struggling with gender identity because we don't want to talk about that. But we forget they're our peripheries. They're in our benches. Nobody talked about the kids who are being bullied because their peers don't think they're smart enough or pretty enough or accomplished enough. Nobody wanted to mention the hard questions. The women who had had abortions, nobody wanted to mention them as peripheries. Are they in our pews? Probably. No one mentioned the parents whose children are in prison for one reason or another. Are they in our pews? Most likely. Where is your Calcutta? Where are the people that feel alone and abandoned? We need to help people to have true encounters with Christ so we can keep our eyes open to them. Not just the ones that are here that show up, but the ones that are out there that need to be brought back in. Ask, if any of you are on RCA teams especially, ask people who are trying to come into the church why. And I'll bet you you'll hear a lot of them that say, well, so-and-so in my family experienced this, and I want that. I see my aunt, and she goes to Mass every day, and she has such a peace and calm about her. I want to find that. Ask. The best way to recruit, the best way to bring people in, is word of mouth. We can stand up at the pulpit till we're blue in the face saying, if anybody wants to be Catholic, come to our CIA. Are the people that want to be Catholic in the pews? Probably not. They're probably just discovering where the church is, or maybe they've only been there a couple of weeks and they're not going to feel ready to come forward. It's word of mouth. It's talking to people. It's sharing our testimony and our experiences, who we are and what Christ has done for us. That's what's going to want pe have people have a true encounter with Christ. That's what we are sent forth to do because we are one body, one body in Christ. And we do not stand alone. We are one body, one body in Christ. And he came that we might have life. For he tells us, when you eat my body and you drink my blood, I will live in you and you will live in my love. When you eat my body and you drink my blood, I will live in you and you will live in my love. We are one body, one body in Christ. And we do not stand alone. We are one body, one body in Christ. Watch me. And he came that we might have life. You're an excellent choir. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs>